wheat can strangle your yield potential, but with the right seed selection, farmers can break that chokehold. Hi, I'm Brownfield anchor reporter Megan Grebner, and welcome to Cab Conversations. Joining us today are Todd Vats, Sam Park, Matt Nelson, Daniel Lundin, and Tyler Rugdenhill. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking some time out of your very busy schedule uh, to join us today. So the title of this is called Cab Conversations. While we're not necessarily in the cab of our tractors or our trucks right now, you guys have been spending a lot of time uh, as folks get harvest and those activities underway. Before we get into our conversation today, we're going to focus a lot on channel extend flex beans. I want to just kind of update as to what's going on in your area. Uh, Todd, we'll start with you. Kind of give us a little regional uh regional where you're located and a little bit about what's going on harvest and crop wise. Sure thing. Yeah. So I'm uh, personally located in far Southeast Minnesota, uh, but I cover my geography covers much of, of Minnesota, West central Minnesota. And really uh, we're just kind of starting to get into uh, soybean harvest at this time. Um, kind of some of the, uh, the earlier beans, um, you know, maturity wise and uh, the one five and earlier getting harvested now across the state. And we've had pretty variable weather conditions, particularly with rainfall. So kind of seeing yields all over the board from, you know, kind of, uh, you know, mid thirties uh, to low forties, all the way up to some record yields uh, for some cooperator or some uh, farmers in the upper 70s to low 80s that I've heard. So it's going to be pretty variable. It just depends upon location, soil type, soil depth, and all that different kinds of stuff. But um, I think people are pretty uh, excited to get after it. And I think next week will be kind of a, a big week for a lot of soybean harvest across, the, uh, at least Minnesota, at least. It's definitely uh, an interesting year and, and variability has been something I've heard from farmers and agronomists all over the country. Uh, Matt, let's move down to you in Iowa. Yeah, uh, good morning. Matt Nelson, channel agronomist in central Iowa. So I live in Ames and cover uh, the middle part of the state. Not much harvest, Megan, going on in our neck of the woods. Uh, some silage being chopped, some earlier corn uh, being picked as well in that 99 to 103 day range. Uh, beans from 2 6 on up, we've been able to get into some and, and start to harvest. So uh, while it's variable, there's kind of a seven or eight county area here in central Iowa that's been fortunate. We've been uh, in the lighter color on the drought monitor all summer, we had some rain in late June that really carried us through pollination. So um, corn, I think the bulk will be from 200 uh, bushels to 220, but we've had some fields come out uh, much higher than that. And with beans, more variation there, but um, I think we're seeing probably better yields than we expected. Uh, but it really does depend on your zip code and, and what Mother Nature gave you for rainfall. All right, uh, Tyler, we'll check in with you. Yeah, good morning. Uh, so Tyler Brugdenhill, uh, technical agronomist for Channel South Central Nebraska, but live at Kearney. Uh, harvest really just starting to kick off with soybeans, and it's it's all over the board. What we call our dryland corners, our dryland acres, um, actually seeing a lot of single digits there. Uh, then we go into the irrigated acre and seeing anywhere from 50 all the way up to I've had some that came out at 80. So uh, similar story across the Corn Belt, just you know, the amount of rain that we got, how hard we wanted to work those irrigators uh, is really, you know, starting to show up in our yield. Uh, had a lot of disease moving late with things like sun, sun death syndrome and white mold. So those have been challenges with the soybean acre as well. So uh, Matt put it well, and I think everybody's feeling this variability is going to be one of those words you're going to hear agronomists say again and again and again. Um, corn harvest has been good again off the uh, not talking about the dry land acre, but the irrigated acre uh, looks to be strong. But again, variability is going to change for field to field on what those results uh, yield us. So, Tyler, thanks. Let's move east. Daniel, how are things looking in Illinois? Well, I'd say we're off to a slow start in Illinois. I'm on the western side of northern Illinois, so I'm between the Quad Cities and Peoria. And really not too much harvest has happened. Um, some larger operators that started on some earlier season corn, um, maybe one or two fields of soybeans have gotten harvested, but really nothing much to speak of yet. And uh, a little recap of the season, we got in pretty timely in May. Uh, June was was extremely dry. It started raining towards the second half of July and first week of August. 
Um, then it quit raining. And now that it's harvest time, it started raining again. So now, now we're uh, in a position here where we're not really able to do anything right at the moment. So it'll, it'll be uh, it'll be a while before guys really get up and going. And last but not least, Sam. Sure, sure. So I'm Sam Park. I'm located just west of Columbus. Um, I cover Southwest Ohio. Uh, for the past two years, I was covering all of Ohio. Then as we transitioned the new channel, uh, just covering Southwest. Um, variability across. Um, I think planting dates can be pretty big for where we were at uh, as far as corn goes. So if you look at the moisture, uh, we went dry for about a month from mid-May to mid-June. Uh, then in June, our temperatures dropped. We got a pretty good amount of moisture. So we kind of caught up there, but lost some GDUs on the corn side. Um, we were able to get adequate rainfall throughout July and August, but then in some areas uh, in August, the rain just, just shut off and we haven't gotten moisture for uh, a few weeks. Uh, harvest is delayed for the most part from corn. Um, like I said, if from what I was walking and doing yield checks um, on the corn side, the stuff that was planted in in April um, seems to be more about average because uh, it hit that V6 knee high time frame right there uh, when it got dry for about a month um, versus the mid May planted corn that uh, it got caught up on rainfall you know, right when it was hitting that 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 V6 time frame right when we're determining those rows around. Uh, soybeans on the April on the April planted soybeans uh, those seem to get up and going. Uh, we're able to um, take that early season drought stress a little bit better. We have I've only heard a, of a little bit of beans getting cut so far. Some earlier beans, uh, two sevens, two eights, but those yields have been going really well so far. I think we're probably still you know two to three weeks out from from people really getting into some beans. Um, May planted beans they kind of got planted right there into those dry conditions. Then they got a little bit cooler in June, a lot of moisture in June um, with some heavy smoke that came through. So those things took a little bit while longer to get going. But then last week of July, first couple weeks of August, they seem to catch up a lot. So um, I think it'll be variable like everybody else has mentioned, but I'm excited, excited to go into harvest. I think the one thing that's interesting, obviously variability is something that's going to be a conversation or part of that conversation for all of 2023. I think that highlights the need to select the right seed and the right traits uh, for your operations. So as we take a look at that, what are some of the benefits then of planting uh, channel extend flex soybeans? Uh, Matt, I'm going to start with you. I would hit lead off here, Megan. Um, so in terms of, you know, some of the benefits as we talk about variability for, for us, I really feel like we've had a lot of a lot of experience and time to evaluate our varieties. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to see products in our lineup still that were launched um, in the first year of this class, right? 23, 21 is a variety we sell a lot of here in Iowa that we're just very comfortable with, have a lot of experience with. We know how it performs. We know where to place it. And I think that kind of helps keep those varieties on acres where they can succeed. And we, we spend, you know, quite a bit of time trying to verify those placement recommendations as agronomists. That's sort of our role. And it's not always easy to, to try to nail that down, but over time, I think we've really found some products that work well, you know, here in Iowa specifically, we've got products that fit a variety of acres. And I think that's one of the, one of the biggest benefits you get from us is experience. Uh, we, we've had a lot of time to get to know most of these varieties um, and we've seen really stable performance out of them. Tyler. I can try to mute them. Um, yeah, I, I'd say similarly in the West for us, uh, you know, Matt hit the nail on the head is is we've had, th you know, three really good launch classes to be able to look at this at this uh, germplasm and, and also the trait that it carries. And um, selfishly for the West, when we think about our weed species that are challenging to us, having that additional mode of action for chemistry uh, on top of what we had with Roundup Ready Extends, uh, just uh, provides that little bit of extra flexibility to be able to go out and control another weed species post-emerge. Um, feel like we've had great performance and a steady increase in yield potential with every class we launched, and we're very excited to see what the 2024 uh, germplasm class brings for us in yield potential and stability for the West. Daniel? Yeah, I think for... Uh for my seedsmen I work with and, and farmers, it's really all about making sure you've, you're selecting varieties that are you're confident in and that have high yield potential. And I think our Extend Flex portfolio has has that to offer. We've got new products that come in every year and the agronomist, you know, the agronomy team evaluates those and makes sure that 
Uh, those products are fit for the right acres. They're um, high performing, high yield potential, and also agronomically sound so that you can have confidence in, in those products on your farm. Todd, what about you for your farmers in your area? Well, I think, you know, I think what's really shown this year with the lack of precipitation that we've seen across the area, a lot of areas that didn't necessarily canopy, and if it did canopy, it wasn't until late. Uh, weed control has been extremely important. And, you know, particularly with our Extend Flex program, we've really pushed to go early, uh, making sure that we're getting out there and getting pre's down and then using the Extend the Max, um, you know, either as a pre or early post, making sure that we're getting those weeds managed when they're small, you know, getting that residual out there so that, you know, in a year like this, when we don't necessarily have the, the rain or precipitation to, uh, to activate a lot of the herbicides and, and to get that canopy cover that, that offers that weed control later, being able to make sure that we have those weeds dead early and then so that we can maintain these clean fields throughout the season. And so, um, you know, I think with the Extend Flex program, that's really given us that flexibility to do that. And then like everybody else has said, the ergonomics that this, uh, that our germplasm has brought has, has really helped us out. We've got great depth with, you know, IDC is really important for us in Western Minnesota. White mold is a big deal for Eastern Minnesota and the last uh, couple of launch classes have really expanded those uh, portfolios. So we've got some really nice things going all the way around with that. Sam, we'll finish up with you. Sure. Um, I think, you know, first things first, when you get the, that channel extend flex bag of beans, um, it's the service that you get when you're buying a, a bag of channel beans uh, from your seedsman, uh, from us uh, working with you to, to place it and make sure we're getting that on the right acre. Um, the strong agronomic packages are, are a big piece of it. So we typically have cooler, wetter springs when folks are trying to get in in April. So having something with good emergence and vigor um, that the extend flex germ plasmas bring in is, is really important to get that stuff up and moving. Um, another big one is going to be having a strong disease package. So uh, we have some pretty heavy clay soils, some soils that are poorly drained. So phytophthora root rot's a big one. Um, and in our in our varieties, you know, we have some with the single single gene or some with the double stack gene. Uh, so, I'm really confident about where we can place place some of these varieties when it comes to Phytophthora root rot um, is one of your big concerns. Um, and like all the other folks have mentioned, that triple or beside stack, um, being able to start clean, stay clean in a year like this year, where some of those May planted beans took a little bit while to get to canopy. Um, always important to to be able to control weeds. Um, and, and by use, able to be able to use uh, Liberty in season, extend and max in season, um, that's just extremely important because when we have weeds in the field, um, that's going to decrease the yield and overall decrease profitability. So uh, the, like I said, the, the agronomics, the herbicide flexibility has been huge for us. Daniel, what are the benefits of applying extend and max herbicide with vapor grip technology, uh, restricted use pesticide? Yeah, so if you look at my area and the weeds that we constantly battle, it's water hemp, mare's tail. I mean, those those two weeds are problematic and continue to you know show up this year, especially I think Todd mentioned how dry the, the June was and it was dry around here. And you know, when you don't have moisture in June to activate your residual chemistry, um, you're kind of sitting out there unprotected. And with Extendamax with vapor grip technology, you get a little bit of we call it soil activity, so you can get some some benefit from uh, a little bit of drier period of time before you get rainfall to activate your residual. Uh, but but extended max of vapor grip offers excellent uh, knockdown um, of those problematic weeds I, I mentioned, and also allows you to uh, kind of go out there. There are requirements you have to follow, of course, with any with any herbicide. But you know the the vapor grip uh, helps to maintain that that product stays where it's where it's put. Matt, what do you share with your growers? Oh, weed control is challenging, Megan. It's been a challenging year. You know, I think corn's had a lot of issues in the state as well. But um, wh where I really see a big advantage that the Extend Flex system has is, is that residual that Daniel mentioned. Uh, as we've started to plant beans earlier, and for Todd up in Minnesota, he's, you know, early may be early May for them, but we have a lot of uh, this year in Iowa, Easter planted soybeans, right? So April 9th and April 10th, 
uh, almost a month earlier than our frost date here. So that's that's very early, uh, and that's a shift in practices. And what what we've what we've noticed is as we put pre's on before planting, like we've we've trained. So all of us on this panel have done a good job of training growers to use pre's before we plant. But that pre runs out by the time weeds actually start to emerge. Right, if you're spraying a pre in early April and it gives you 40 days, by the time the weeds start to come up in mid May, that pre's run out of activity. So being able to use extend extend a max on those you know b2 beans the, those beans right as they're emerging um, with a residual product like warrant what that does is give you activation right away um, 14 to 21 days of residual from that extend a max and then hopefully by the time that runs out your your group 15 product will have been activated by rainfall and that's just something that other growth regulators can't offer that's something pretty unique to to that canvas so um, that's been really valuable uh, in Iowa, the people who did that have had some of the cleanest fields across the state, and it's been very noticeable. And I think that's something I've been really addressing with customers is if we're going to start planting soybeans earlier and earlier, it really does change some paradigms in terms of weed management. And I just want to make sure farmers are aware of that. Tyler, what about you for growers in your area, especially knowing how dry that part of the country has been? Yeah, um it's it's funny. I listen to my cohorts. I mean, we think about Iowa and Illinois, typically not not super dry states. We know we're going to be dry, right? So um, having a, a soybean management system that does a very good job from start to finish on how we control those weeds, but also having a soybean variety that's going to canopy for us is, is a big part of this. I have a lot of growers that are growing in 30 inch rows, so we don't have a lot of what in in my old territory or where I grew up in what we call narrow and uh, narrow row beans. We're doing a lot of 30 inch on unirrigated production and dry land. So um, having a soybean variety that canopies and canopies fast for us is good from a weed control standpoint, but also from a moisture conservation standpoint, shading that ground, making sure we're not losing any of that sort of moisture that's so uh, important to those plants that are actively growing. But um, to Daniel's point, making sure utilizing that extend max with vapor grip, making sure that molecule is staying where it needs to be and, and doing its job on the on the soybean acres and controlling the weeds on those acres as well as we can. Sam, for farmers who have concerns about spraying dicamba, explain how that vapor grip technology can help with the drift issues. Sure. Um, so I think there's there's two pieces to that. Um, so First is, you know, you have, you have two different forms of your off-target movement. You got uh, drift and volatility. Um, so ways that we can, you know, minimize drift, and uh, that would be, you know, using a DRA, spraying at the right speed, uh, time of day. So if that's so managing the drift really comes down to following the label and following the recommendations um, there that we provide, or excuse me, pr providing the guide, following the guidelines that that label provides. Um, but really when I look at volatility, uh, that vapor grip, so kind of what that molecule does, um, acts as a buffer. So when you add water and then um, dicamber extend a max, those hydrogen ions, they'll, they'll move over um, and they'll react with um, dicamba to form that dicamba acid, which was much more volatile. And that's really where you see that volatilization come from. So what that vapor grip does acts as a buffer. So instead of those hydrogen molecules moving over um, and forming dicamba acid, they react with that vapor grip molecule. Like I said, acts as a buffer, reducing the amount of dicamba acid that's forming and reducing that volatility. So like we said, if you're, if you're making sure you're following the label um, and then with combining that with that vapor grip technology, you can reduce both that drift both, and that volatility. Um, you can spray that, extend, apply extended max confidently in your fields, um, and, you know, burn down pre or during in season. Todd, anything else you want to add? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, just really on top of that, you know, I think what we found is that, uh, as Sam mentioned, when you follow the label and uh, do everything right, it's just a really, really effective system and really have not seen many issues as far as, you know, the with the drift or volatility because it really gets nailed down when you do things right and follow the label the way it's it's um, written. That's based off a lot of work and a lot of research and a lot of demonstrations and, and it's proven to really work. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a great system um, when it's uh, done properly. So, Daniel, can you, can you talk about the defensive agronomics of channel like Stenflex soybeans that help protect against all those top soybean diseases? Yeah, I know in my area we we were very concerned on 
um, kind of on a line between if we're concerned about white mold or not because of the, of the way I am in the state. But, you know, white mold is always in the back of everyone's mind, uh, just mostly because there's really no after the fact control. So you really got to have economic uh, protection up front. And when we bring in new products into the portfolio in the extend flex portfolio, we really look to add a uh, white mold tolerance. Um, we've, we've increased that over the years. Um, the another, another part is phytophthora. I think we mentioned that earlier. Um, even with seed treatments, you still need phytophthora protection uh, deeper into the season. So bringing in products that um, can offer that defensive characteristic of protection, but also high yield potential. You know, that's a balancing act there that you got to uh, work through. And then uh, I would say lastly, uh, sudden death syndrome has been a uh, concern of, of many farmers. There are seed treatments to help with that, but if you can have a baseline protection of, of good sudden death products um, in our, like we do in our portfolio, that's, that's very helpful. Tyler, what about you? Yeah, so it, as these guys would all say, agronomy is local, right? So when we think about a defensive characteristic and a soybean trait, I'd say if you asked all of us what's the most important one, we, you'd probably get all different answers. And um, for us in Nebraska in the West, um, iron deficiency chlorosis, dealing with high pH acres is a big deal for us. So um, we look at that initial screening and, and score that we get out of uh, a product launch class and then also test it locally to make sure um, that it's meeting our requirements to be able to handle those high pH acres. Similarly, we are dealing with things like sudden death syndrome and, and white mold as well. And every management step that you take, it's, it's a layered approach, right? We never want to rely on one thing to holistically manage an issue. If we can layer that approach by selecting the appropriate variety, and then if we need, you know, that additional help from a seed treatment or depending on what that characteristic is, we're looking to uh, manage on those acres. Um, a layered approach is always going to be better than just relying on one thing to hopefully control the problem for us. Matt, we'll finish up with you. Hard to add too much to what uh, all of my colleagues have mentioned, but uh, they're spot on. Um, one thing that we've been working with, right, in, in our area, again, with our early planting, it's kind of shifted um, Way that we position beans and again it's a benefit to, to knowing more about these varieties to testing them locally is if we're going to plant earlier like we have been we've increased probably the risk of a lot of those soybean diseases right phytophthora infection early but primarily sds and white mold just due to the amount of time those beans sit in the ground or the height that they reach before canopy so it really helps to have soybeans with some ratings that you understand and know and we're always evaluating that with newer products but again in our on the established part of our lineup it's allowed us to place those beans um, on those early planted acres. Also, standability, that's another, another factor that can change when you plant beans early. So um, that's part of our job, right? To test those new products and evaluate those for those for those traits. And it's something that you know we all we all do every year and um, and get a lot of value out of. And I think just having this much agronomy support can help us kind of nail those uh, to make sure we accurately understand what those beans are going to do uh, when we go out and plant them. Two-part question, Todd, for you, why is it so important for farmers to find the right choice in weed control? And then how do you help determine what works for their farm? Well, sure. I mean, that's, it's extremely important, I guess, to be able to understand each individual grower, uh, what type of weed populations they have, what type of um, objectives they have for the season, um, you know, their field layout, location, um, you know, and particularly as we get with weed control and if there's some different restrictions on where we can make applications, it's important to know that, um, you know, if there's any uh, um, you know, boundaries that we need to, you know, setbacks and stuff like that, it's important. So, yeah, I mean, putting that all together and uh, making up a plan uh, for the particular uh, farmer customer in that sense is extremely important. And it's, and again, it's mixing it all together with their weed management as well as economic needs. Um, looking at what the past year has been and whether it's uh, disease or moisture uh, limitations, it all kind of comes together. So, um, so yeah, those are uh, all very important uh, aspects of it. Dan, your thoughts? Sure. So I think, um, right, how, how do you determine what the right choice in program is? Um, 
like Todd mentioned, it's let's identify what those troublesome weeds are. Um, you know, and, and once when you do that, then we can make sure that we're implementing a plan that's going to take care of those. Um, so if, you know, if, if you were to have a resistant weed in there, there's no, no point in applying that chemistry. So by identifying which one uh, that we, you know, what problems that you have on your field, then you can make sure that you're implementing a program that's going to have effective control. And then kind of the second piece of that is, you know, why is that control um, important? Uh, pretty simply, it's just weeds reduce yield and profitability. I was reading, uh, you know, University of Illinois set found a 26 year study um, that if you had inadequate late season control, um, that could be a 41% yield loss. And that's pretty colossal. That's huge. Um, so by making sure we're building the right program, figuring out what, what they have or what issues they have, building the right program to fit that, um, hopefully we can stay clean throughout the rest of the season and, and maximize yields. Daniel, um, I'm assuming this is a conversation that kind of changes regionally or the solution changes regionally. So what's the conversation you have with those Illinois growers? Well, right now it's, it's really easy to see the failures out there in terms of weed control. And I think the conversation has changed over the last five years where farmers were really focused on yield potential and yield potential only. And now they're focused on weed control and then yield potential. So we got to kind of loop them back around to really focus on yield potential and weed control at the same time. And how do you, how do you get both without sacrificing one or the other? And I think where you do that is the Roundup uh, Extend Flex system because you get high performing genetics, uh, you get good defensive characteristics, and then you got people you can work with to develop a good weed control program that can target what's likely your most challenging weeds with, with for us, water hemp and, and mare's tail. And you'll really look at how your season went this year. And if you do the same thing next year and expect different results, it's, it's not going to happen. And uh, we just got to look at that and evaluate that. And, and hopefully we can make some changes that helps them out. Matt. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Dan. And another thing we, we like to think about too, right. Is, is how, you know, logistically, how is your operation set up? That that a lot of times affects um, what's easy for guys to spray, right? Can you can you get out can you get out over those beans um, when they're when they're just coming up? Are you really banking on applications closer to row closure? Um, you know when when you're spraying your corn, and a lot of that comes down to how they how they apply it if they do it themselves um, or if a co-op does it for them. So what I tend to see is, you know, if you're, if a, if a farmer's applying chemistry on their own, they, they almost have more flexibility, right? They kind of control their schedule a little bit more. Um, maybe they can't cover as many acres or cover them as quickly, but um, I think that really, if, if you've got that flexibility that, you know, it matches well with what that camera can offer in terms of being able to be used uh, as a pre or kind of as an early post um, and then come back in with, with glufosinate, um, closer to that, that flowering period. So that's one thing we kind of talk about a lot too, you know, what, how do you manage those acres in terms of the process of putting your herbicide out and those logistics? And, uh, we can kind of help them have that conversation. Tyler, we'll finish up with you. Yeah. So, so in the West, specifically Nebraska, I mean, the, our, our big weed species that we're dealing with right now is palm amaranth, and you're talking, uh, weed biology, I mean, a, a plant that can germinate anywhere from late April all the way to um, essentially the middle of September. So um, having a, a herbicide management system with residuals built in, not just one residual, but overlapping and making sure uh, in a perfect world that we never even see that weed species come up in a field in terms of a management style, um, making sure we're always ahead of that next layer of residual to make sure we don't get any that come through that canopy. The other thing I'd mention is uh, thinking about things like crop rotation. So state of Nebraska, obviously we could have people go to wheat, we can have them corn, soybeans, um, potatoes, you name it. So um, understanding what that grower's ambitions are for that next growing season and understanding where those uh, where those herbicide cutoffs need to be in terms of what that next sensitive crop could be uh, and understanding that for um, what their growing aspirations are the next season is going to be really important uh, in our neck of the woods, uh, making sure that everything's clean and making sure that that next growing crop is going to have a good start in terms of the weed bank. 
We've talked a lot about what the Extendflex soybeans bring to the field for farmers. Let's also talk a little bit about the weed control component with Extendflex technology. Um, Daniel, I'm going to start with you. So we're talk, asking about the weed control in this in the so in the soybean system, and, and if you drive around the countryside, at least where I'm at, you can really pick out the fields that have been managed well and that have some work to do. And when I talk to farmers and when I talk to my seedsmen, uh, I feel like the people that are in our Roundup Extend Flex system are having fewer challenges. I know that's anecdotal, but um, you know, offering some flexibility on the post side, post herbicide side, is you know, something that goes with that, but it's also, I think, the way that we drive earlier applications and overlapping residuals, and we've talked about that, and, and making sure that our farmers are set up for success that way, because if we've waited uh, for those weeds to emerge, we've we've lost some of the uh, benefits, I would say, of the of the system, of the ExtendFlex system, and, you know, these weeds are not easy to control. They're not your weeds from 1980 that are easy to control. They're, these are these are weeds that are super hard to control and they have multiple flushes throughout the season and you've got to make sure you attack them aggressively and not wait for them to come to you. Tyler, what do you do with your growers in your area when you're having the conversation about weed control and the benefits of ExtendFlex technology? Yeah, I, I think um, I think Daniel hit the nail on the head too is, is making sure we have those overlap residuals, making sure we're controlling weeds before we even see them. Uh, because in this day and age, that's, that's the best time to control them. Um, you know, making sure we have uh, reasonable expectations on if we do see something emerge, we need to get it, we need to be out, we need to be timely. Um, the more we let them grow, the harder those weed species are to control. And to Daniel's point, um, the, the the days of easy weed control have been gone and have been you know gone for a while so the the longer you give them time to to grow develop a, a larger root system um that's just a, a way way harder factory that you're going to have to to try and control and, and take out of your your crop management system overall so the longer you let them go the worse it's going to get in terms of weed control so again overlapping residuals and making sure we have uh, a, a adequate chemistry uh, action plan in place from the get-go is, is the best control we have. Matt? Yeah. Um, boy, I think dicamba, right? So it, it provides a lot of benefit post, but again, as we've kind of talked about here, as, as, it's, as we've had more restrictions to the label, um, as this system has evolved, I really do think that value is is pre or right as those beans are emerging. And we've, we've always kind of talked about this. We've always said, you know, spray 22 ounces at 22 days. So really that that mentality, Megan, has been around for a while now. But I think we've really started to see as glufosinate um, has kind of come down in price and become more available and people have gotten more used to spraying it. Uh, even though that that can be a little trickier to get excellent application, there's a lot of factors involved in terms of weather. Using getting that residual power um, right around that pre-emergence timing, or especially as those beans are are very small, um, to me there's just a ton of value there. There's no other system that can offer that from a growth regulator that you can use um, post-emergence and even with label restrictions. Right, I think it still gives you a good window to get that put on in that time frame, and I just think that offers um, utility if you're planting early. It also, it also offers that if you're planting in your normal, you know, mid-May to, to early June timeframe, that that 14 days plus can give you uh, a really nice start on that residual weed control. And, and it, you know, overlapping residuals is really key. And it's really nice to have that to help make sure we can keep some residual activity in that soil, uh, really from the time that pre is put on until we've got canopy um, and we're off into July. Todd, talk to me about the spray early weed control guarantee. Yeah, sure. So um, we, we do have a, a guarantee out there that if you follow uh, some specific recommendations um, getting out, it's basically start clean and stay clean. So there are several different options that you can uh, to utilize, but, it, but again, it's kind of what we've already been, you know, uh, reiterating several times in here is getting out there early. Um, of course, with a burn down or with a, uh, a pre-plant or a very early post, making sure that you're getting the weeds controlled. 
and then following up again within uh, 30 days with another um, post in a overlapping residual, then there is a uh, guarantee that uh, that you'll uh, stay clean throughout the uh, throughout the season. If you don't, then there will be some uh, some uh, help with some some uh, money or some uh, additional sprays in that sense. So. So it's a it's a system that uh, we're pretty confident in, and it works very good. And and again, I think you know the main emphasis to this, and this was what Matt was really just covering, is just getting out there and and getting it early. Start clean and stay clean. And you know so much. And this is kind of you know back what Daniel was talking about, which is where you can see fields now that are not necessarily utilizing that program. If there's weeds that are sticking up in the fields now that have come up in August. A lot of those fields, if I go out and walk them, you know, you, you look at the water hemp and well, it, it's basically, it's two main branches and you look at the plant and there's a, a the terminal bud that was sprayed, but it was sprayed too late and it maybe killed the terminal, but then you have two lateral branches that came up and those were weeds that were sprayed too late, you know, past that four inch stage or whatever. So a lot of what our programs are doing is really emphasizing getting in early, killing those weeds when they're two inches tall, three inches tall, or not letting them emerge at all. And there's, that's really the best way to kill the weeds. So, so that's really kind of what we're going at with that. We've talked a lot about the importance of early season weed control. Sam, um, what are your thoughts? What do you talk to your growers about in Ohio? Absolutely. So I think a lot of the folks here kind of nailed it, but um, just the importance of layered residuals, uh, you know, what's the easiest weed to kill is the one that never comes up. And so what, uh, you know, using that extended max at, at pre and then you layer a group 15 like warrant on top of it um, with the little amount of moisture that it takes to activate that extended max, we know that we're going to be able to just start clean. Um, and then with a little bit more moisture, we can then activate that warren or group 15 and stay clean for longer. So um, looking at it from a weed resistance or herbicide resistance management standpoint, um, by killing them early or never letting them come up, we're going to stop that next um, where to stop them from, from going to seed, uh, building up potential resistance, and then also adding to that, that seed bank that's in the soil. So um, a weed that's easier to kill, right, is either one that doesn't come up or one that's less than four inches. So um, that's really what we try to hammer on is the importance of just layering those residuals. Uh, and like uh, Todd had mentioned, we do have we do have the program for that as well to, to back it up. So um, like I said, layered residuals and, and just trying to keep them from ever coming up. Daniel, Matt, Tyler, any other final thoughts about that early season weed control? Yeah, I, I guess I'll leave with the final thought on that is just, you know, being aggressive is super important. I think, you know, thinking about your program and um, doing something today versus tomorrow because those weeds are going to be growing no matter what. And you know, we saw it with dry conditions, the weeds still emerged. <laughs> Uh, we see it with a lot of rainfall, the weeds still emerge. So you know, doing something today instead of waiting for tomorrow or next week when you when you think you're going to do a, get, get more weeds out there or something like that, that's not the right, right way to go anymore. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for the conversation about uh, weed control and learning more about ExtendFlex soybeans. Here's to a very safe and bountiful harvest for your farmers and your areas. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thanks for joining Cab Conversations. You can learn more at our website, brownfieldagnews.com. I'm Megan Grebner for Brownfield. <laughs>